Okay, let's get back to uh, going again. So, um, that pretty much concludes what I want to say about protein structure in general. We're going to see that protein structure is going to come up again and again um, through the rest of the term. Um, and I hope I've impressed on you in talking about the basics of protein structure, that structure is absolutely essential and that it explains everything um, uh, about a protein. Uh, what I want to do now is to turn our attention to uh, what is sort of loosely described as protein characterization. Uh, part of it is involved in using our knowledge of protein structure as a way of, of uh, studying proteins and, and other places where, especially to start, we're going to be talking about our knowledge of protein structure as a way of purifying proteins. So purifying proteins is um, very important for us because um, biochemists uh, know what they know about biochemistry by virtue of the fact that they've purified essentially every protein that a cell makes. And purification is not a trivial thing. Uh, purification means isolating a protein apart from every other cell component. And every other cell component includes thousands of other proteins. It includes millions, billions, trillions of metabolites that are present in the cell. Um, it includes all classes of compounds from nucleotides to DNA to RNA to amino acids to fats to all kinds of things. And so the purification process has not only got to isolate that protein uh, of interest, but it's all, it also has to be able to uh, keep that protein active. Okay? And we've seen that protein structure can be fairly unstable in some cases. Not all proteins are like the ones that you've seen that are so stable. In fact, the vast majority of them are very unstable. If you ever work in a laboratory and you try to purify proteins, what you will see is that you'll bang your head on the wall because you'll get a purification method going, all of a sudden the protein dies. Okay? So that can be very, very uh, maddening. So it's important to keep in mind as we're purifying proteins that there are many considerations um, in uh, getting them. So when we start with um, purifying proteins, one of the first things that we do uh, in a biochemistry lab is we use techniques uh, for basically isolating um, uh, or starting fractionating the um, uh, cells that have the proteins in them. Um, it's pretty hard to walk into a biochemistry laboratory and not see a centrifuge. And the reason we have centrifuges is that centrifuges allow us to use centrifugal force as a means of separating molecules on the basis of size, at least at a very gross level. Okay? So uh, divide and conquer being the uh, operative idea here, the very simple idea behind this figure is that if we take cells and we bust them up, bust them open, oh, bless it. We bust them open, which is what we're doing over here on the left, okay? We're basically taking what are intact cells and making them spill their insides out to where everything uh, is now in this solution. If we spin that down, we can imagine we're going to have a liquid fraction and a solid fraction. The solid fraction is going to include fairly large things like cell membranes and things like that that form a pellet in the bottom. And the liquid portion may contain other uh, more soluble components. Well, depending upon how fast we spin uh, these uh, various uh, components, we can isolate and pellet different things. And that's really all the f this figure is designed to show us. I don't care that you know which ones are where and all that sort of thing. But you can imagine the faster you spin it, the smaller the thing will, will start precipitating. Big things precipitate with, with not too much centrifugation. Well, that gives us different fractions of samples to work with, and those fractions are uh, important. Taking in what we do to those fractions ultimately gives us a protein that uh, is pure. One of the common steps that we use in um, purification process is a phenomenon called dialysis. I'm sure if you've ever taken a biology lab, you probably have done the dialysis tubing experiment where you take um, and place a sample into a dialysis tubing. Dialysis tubing has uh, pores that are small enough that they won't let large molecules escape, but they will let small molecules, in fact, escape and cross the membrane. So we can see here that someone has taken a, um, uh, a sample that has proteins in red, and it has a bunch of ions. It's, these ions might be things like sodium chloride, for example, and the person wants to get rid of the sodium chloride or at least reduce the concentration of it as much as possible. So by putting it into a solution that doesn't contain sodium chloride and sodium chloride can pass through the membrane, uh, 
then we see the sodium and chloride ions for the most part pass out. The proteins can't, and uh, we're left with now a mixture that has proteins with very little uh, sodium chloride. We have essentially desalted the solution. Okay, so that was useful. That was a fairly uh, straightforward, fairly common technique for getting rid of small molecules uh, apart from bigger ones. A more sophisticated technique for separating big from small works um, as we see here. And this is a cool technique uh, called gel filtration. Okay? It's also called gel exclusion. Um, it also includes the word chromatography. So I want to say a word about chromatography and then I'll talk about the technique. So when you hear the word chromatography, basically people are using this word when they're describing a separation. So chromatography is a word used to describe separation. And it, aro it arose from the fact that in the olden days that people who worked with inks um, used techniques for separating inks. And the chrome part of the chromatography in involved color. Okay, so we use the term chromatography to use separation in general, not just the separation of colored compounds. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say, in fact, you can see here they've got colors showing us the various things going through there, but trust me, most proteins don't have a color. All right, so we're using the term chromatography to describe separations. So now I need to tell you how some of these separation techniques work. This separation technique is called gel exclusion or gel uh, molecular exclusion chromatography. Um, and it involves the use of little tiny beads. So imagine little beads, maybe a millimeter or less in diameter, fairly small little tiny beads, they're round little spheres, and that's what's shown here by these sort of gray circly things right here where my arrow is, okay? So these beads okay, um, have an interesting property. They have little tunnels that go through them little tiny tunnels. Now the tiny tunnels are even smaller than the bead itself. I guess that's duh -uh, because if we were bigger then they <laughs> we wouldn't have a bead. But they have an interesting property. All of the tunnels have the same size of opening. They all have the same size of opening. So I, and I can get one set of beads that all have one size of opening. I can get a different size of beads that have a different size opening. But in any given experiment, I'm only using one size that has one size of opening. Right? That opening turns out to be the basis of the separation I'm getting ready to describe to you. All the beads have the same size of opening. Let's imagine that I've taken my cells, I've busted them open, I've centrifuged away a lot of the stuff that I don't want. Now I've got this liquid mixture that's in uh, my hands, and it's full of proteins, zillions of different proteins. Okay? Some proteins are very large. A large protein might have a molecular weight of greater than 200,000. Some proteins may be very small. They may have molecular weights of 1,000 or less. So a very wide range of sizes. This technique I'm getting ready to describe to you allows me to separate those proteins, or at least sort them out, on the basis of size. Well, how does it work? Well, I've got big proteins. There's my yellow guys down here. And you can see the yellow guys are the ones that would be like on the order of 200,000. I've got little tiny guys up here that might be on the order of, let's say, 10,000. What happens to these guys as they're passing through that solution? Well, what they're, what's happening as they're passing through the solution is that I apply it to the top of the column. The column has liquid flowing through it, so liquid is moving downwards, that's why it says flow. And these molecules are moving with the flow. Now, it's at this point I'd like to give a little analogy, thinking about what happens with these different sets of beads. Imagine that you are going to the county fair, and you are grandpa and grandma, or your mom and dad, or you're a little kid. Okay? Now, when you get to the county fair and you're a little kid and you've never been to the county fair before and all of a sudden you see these rides and there's all these rides <coughs> everywhere you want to go, what do you want to do? You want to get on those rides, right? The kid wants to go and ride on every ride that is at the county fair. Grandma and grandpa has been around for a long time and they've got ulcers and they've got all whatever, 
So they really don't feel like they want to get on every ride with, with the kid, no matter how much they love the kid. Well, okay, why don't you go with mom and dad and you can have a nice time on this ride. They're walking through the county fair. Grandma and grandpa gets on no rides. If we look getting on no rides and they're walking through the county fair, grandma and grandpa are going to move through that county fair relatively rapidly. Mom and dad are kind of worried about the kid and they want the kid to have a good experience. So for the first couple of rides, mom and dad say, okay, we'll go with you and they ride on a few of the rides. But mom and dad get tired of that and if we again use this analogy of moving through the fair, they keep moving through the fair. Who goes through the fair the slowest? The kid. The kid's the smallest in size. The same thing happens with these beads. The smallest proteins enter those little holes and those little holes are the rides. They are going through those tunnels. They are therefore taking a longer path through this tube, this column. So they're passing through here. They're going, the little guys are going, oh boy, here's another bead. Oh boy, here's another bead. Oh boy, right? The green guys are big enough that they have a hard time fitting into those. They may make it into a few of them, but they don't make it into nearly as many. The yellow guys down here at the bottom are too big to fit into any of them, and they don't want to go in them anyway. They just go sliding through. The yellow ones go through the shortest path because they don't go through the tunnels. The greens go through a medium length path, and the red ones go through the longest path. So this technique that I'm describing to you separates molecules on the basis of size. The largest ones come out first, and the smallest ones come out last for the reason that I just stated. Okay, now, a very cool uh, technique. There are other techniques that we use. Of course, size is only one way of separating molecules. We can also use charge, okay? Let's imagine I have another set of beads that I have made up, and instead of making up beads with holes in them, I make beads that have chemical groups attached to their outside. The chemical groups that are attached to their outside are full of negative charges, in this case. Okay? So I've got beads that are full of negative charges. I take my mixture of proteins. My proteins are going to have some that have a negative charge, some that have a zero charge, and some that have a positive charge, right? I pour them onto this. Those beads that have a negative charge will attract the most positively charged proteins and the most positively charged proteins will stick. The most negatively charged proteins, they want out of there right now, they are going to go zooming through this column faster than anything else. The zeros are going to be somewhere in between. So this technique I've just described to you is called anion exchange, I'm sorry, it's called ion exchange chromatography. And specifically, this one is called cation exchange chromatography. Why is it called cation exchange chromatography? Well, there actually is an exchange that happens. I lied to you when I said I have beads that are only negatively charged. In fact, what I have are beads that are negatively charged that have a counter ion to start with. So the bead may have a lot of negative charges, but it has a counter ion of sodium on it to start. We can't just in nature pull out a negative charge without originally having a positive charge anywhere else. So we've got this positive counter ion that's there. The protein displaces the positively charged sodium. So it's a cation exchange. That is, the positively charged sodium is being exchanged for a positively charged protein. The sodium goes shooting through. The protein sticks to the column. Can I have anion exchange chromatography? The answer is yes, I can. For anion exchange chromatography, it's simply reversed. I have positively charged beads. They have negative counter ions, like a chloride, for example. And when I pass proteins through it, the positively, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, the negatively charged uh, proteins are going to displace the chlorides and stick to the positively charged bead. In anion exchange chromatography, the negatively charged protein sticks to the positively charged bead. So these techniques are useful now for separating proteins on the basis of charge. And one of the questions I frequently get from students at this point is, well, which one do I use? The answer is you probably use all of them. There's no one technique that's going to give you what you're after.
I'll show you later a technique that's pretty good at that. But these basic techniques, a person who's pur purifying protein has to use anything and everything that they can to separate. So these are some very simple and essential tools for separation. Okay, um, here is a very cool technique that you may think works pretty much in one step. And in some cases, it actually can do um, uh, things in, relative, in, in a fairly short order. It's called affinity chromatography. It uses yet a different kind of bead. The bead may have the same size as the ones that we had before, but now instead of having holes in it or having charges put onto it, it has a specific molecule put onto it. What does that mean? Well, let's imagine that I am studying a protein that I know binds to ATP. I know it binds to ATP, okay? That means my protein's going to have a binding site for ATP. What if I took and made a column where instead of having negative or positive charges on it, I stuck ATP on that bead? ATP is physically attached to the bead. My bead now has hundreds or thousands of ATPs sitting on it. And I take and I make this column, and I apply my proteins to the top of the column. What's going to happen? Well, this one they have glucose, but it doesn't really matter. Or this one they have... Um, uh, yeah, glucose, it doesn't really matter. The point is that every place where there's an ATP and my, every protein that binds ATP is going to stick to those beads. That will include my protein. It will include any protein that has a binding site for ATP. So in one step, I have just purified all the proteins in the cell that bound to ATP. That's a very, very cool technique. Well, the next question is, well, how do I get the proteins off the column? If the one I want is binding ATP and it's stuck on the column, how am I going to get it out? Okay. Well, this relies on the fact that, and this is a very important point, relies on the fact that binding by proteins is almost never covalent. If it were, we would not get it off the column. The binding between a protein and a molecule is almost never covalent covalent. If it's never covalent, that means that there is a time when the protein will bind and there's a time when the protein will let go. All right? It's not a permanent binding. That's a very important point. So it may be on there a lot, but it's not a permanent binding. That becomes the basis for how we get the protein off of that column, and that's what they're trying to show you here. In this case, they had a protein that bound to glucose. How do they get the protein off the column? They add glucose to the column, okay? Because when that protein lets go of the bead, it grabs a hold of free glucose and no longer is stuck to the bead. How do I get the protein off of my ATP column? I'm going to add ATP, okay? So in this way, I can get my protein bound to the column to start with and then washed off of the column by using the very same compound not bound to the bead to pull it off. Affinity chromatography is a great way to separate proteins if you know that they bind to something specifically. Okay. All right. Questions about that? I'm just kind of zipping through these guys here. Okay. Um, let's talk about another technique, a technique called high-performance liquid chromatography, a very common, uh, tech, a very common um, methodology found in uh, modern biochemistry laboratories. It's also a type of chromatography, uh, but it, it um, really exists in a different way than these other methods I've described to you. The other methods I've described to you, you can have a little tube, and that little tube basically has liquid flowing through it. And the liquid flowing through it provides a way of pulling the proteins along as they go. High-performance liquid chromatography is also chromatography, and it uses a separation method that's sort of like what we see in the tube-based chromatography, but it takes it to an extreme. Now, instead of, and by the way, a lot of people call high-performance liquid chromatography high-pressure liquid chromatography because it requires high pressure for it to work. 
That means that this liquid is not going to flow through all by itself. It might take 5,000 PSI to push the liquid through an HPLC column. So HPLC columns, first of all, are packed very, very densely. They're nothing like the ones that we've seen before. Liquid will not flow through them easily. By packing them densely, we've got more beads, as it were. They're smaller. The particles are smaller. And for every bead that we had in the original when we had a way of separation, the more beads, the more separation, the more things we can separate, HPLC allows us, therefore, to separate things that are very, very, very similar to each other effectively because there's more separation material because it's packed so densely. Okay? Now I'm going to tell you how the basis in which that material works in just a second. But what you see on the screen is a plot that comes off of an HPLC. One takes materials one wants to separate, uses a, a fancy device called an injector and injects the samples into the HPLC. This applies them to the top of the column and then a very high pressure pump pushes them through. In this case, we're measuring absorbance. These compounds absorb light at 220 nanometers. And by plotting the absorbance of the light, we see the elution profile of the materials that have been separated by the column. Here's one compound. Here's another couple of compounds. And we can see that there's varying degrees of separation that we get based on the column. Now, how does HPLC work? HPLC has a variety of strategies, but the one I'm going to describe to you is called reverse phase HPLC. It's the most, commonly one, most common one used. Reverse phase HPLC uses as its support, and you can think of the support as the same thing as being the beads if you would like, little particles that have nonpolar chains sticking off of them. Nonpolar chains. So we think of something like an alkane. All right. So something might have, let's say, 20 or, or let's see, no, not 20, but let's say 10 to 18 carbons with only hydrogens on there. Those would be sticking off of these little particles that are in this column. Now, with HPLC, we see that, first of all, we have a hydrophobic material. We haven't seen hydrophobic material before. We had charge. We had holes. We had affinity for certain molecules. But now we see we've got a hydrophobic material that's there. What reverse phase HPLC does is it separates on the basis of polarity. Something that's highly polar will not interact with those long chains. Highly polar materials will come out first. So on this particular column right here, the most polar compound that's in this solution comes out at about 10 minutes. It's number five there. It didn't interact very rapidly. I'm, I'm sorry, I've got it backwards. Sorry, sorry, I said this is the first one. I, these are plotted different ways. The first one to come out is actually right here, number one. Sorry. So the first thing that comes off the column is the very, very polar material. It came out in only five minutes. It didn't interact with the beads very much. It came shooting through, just like the negatively charged proteins came off the column that had the negative beads. This guy wasn't very polar. It came through. Nonpolar molecule would be fairly water soluble. Nonpolar molecule might have charges on it. It might have a lot of hydroxyl groups on it. By contrast, if we look at molecule number five, it came out later. It interacted more with those long nonpolar side chains. This guy, number five, was the least polar compound in there. It interacted more with the column material. So reverse phase liquid chromatography separates on the basis of polarity, the least polar ones coming out last, the most polar ones coming out first. Now there are other types of HPLC. I'm not going to go through all of them because I think it's just kind of a waste of time. But you get the idea. Uh, about this. Now, HPLC is very widely used because of that dense packing. Uh, 
It allows separations that can literally, in one step, give you pure compound if you're fortunate. And so that uh, works here. This can be used for proteins. It can be used for peptides. It can be used for nucleotides. It can be used, for, excuse me, for a lot of different uh, types of compounds. Okay. Now, uh, more commonly in a molecular biology lab, we're interested in analyzing a sample that may have a lot of proteins in it. It may have a lot of DNA molecules, and we simply want to visualize those molecules separated on the basis of size and in a fairly straightforward manner. Gel chromatography, which I'm getting ready to describe to you, um, allows you to do that. Many of you in here, I'm sure, have probably run gels. People run them in high school now. If you haven't run them before, I'll show you how they work. Um, but gels allow us to separate fairly large molecules uh, in a reasonable uh, time fashion. There are other way these are yet another way of separating on the basis of size. Well, before I tell you about polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, I want to tell you about a related technique that's known as, as uh, agarose gel electrophoresis. Okay? Now, it in principle is the same, but I think uh, I need to set up agarose gel electrophoresis before I set up polyacrylamide gel. How many people here run agarose gels? A few. Okay. So agarose gels, uh, first of all, a gel. What is a gel? Well, a gel is a gelatinous material that is the basis of separation. If you've ever had jello, if you ever lived in the Midwest, I guarantee you had jello. I grew up in the Midwest. Jello has the consistency or, uh, of what these gels are, which is where they're um, I'm not sure which one was named for which, but gels have a sort of semi-fluid consistency. They can wiggle and so forth. Okay? The gels are the separation material, and when we look at the gel, if we were to look at it at the molecular basis, we would see that the gel would consist of sort of a series of tangles that's the backbone of the gel. Okay? There's sort of a series of tangles. In the case of an agarose gel, the tangle material is from a compound called agarose that comes from seaweed. It's a polysaccharide. And basically what these tangles provide are holes through which molecules can move. If you want to think about them as pores, you can. But they're holes through which molecules can move. All right? Agarose gel electrophoresis is used to separate DNA and RNA molecules. It's not used for proteins, and the reason is that DNA and RNA molecules are way bigger than proteins. A lot of students don't realize that. DNA and RNA are enormous molecules. They're way bigger than a protein. The holes that I need to use to separate those have to be bigger for DNA molecules than they are for proteins, because DNA and RNA are bigger than proteins are. So agarose gives me bigger holes, as it were. How do I separate a sample? Well, let's say I've got my DNA molecules. They're fragments of varying sizes, and there's a mixture of them. And I just want to see the sizes of DNA that I have in my sample. I take and I pour my gel. You can see the gel in the apparatus right here. You can see the DNA sample being applied right here at the very top. And these little things are called wells. That's the place where the sample is applied. The entire apparatus is closed up, and an electrical current is applied to this gel. You can see that. One end of the gel up at the top is negatively charged. At the bottom, we have positive charge. Now, DNA molecules have a phosphate backbone. Phosphate itself is negatively charged. So DNA and RNA are both like polymers of negative charge. As a consequence, the negative charge repels the DNA. DNA goes away from the negative and towards the positive, And it gets pulled through this support material. Okay. Now you think, well, bigger DNAs have more charge than smaller DNAs, right? So you must have overall the same force per size of DNA. If you take the number of phosphates and divide it by the size, they should all turn out to be equal because each time you add it gets longer, you add another phosphate. So the force is the same for all of them, even though they vary in size. You have the same force. The separation then becomes how fast they can move through the support material. Well, the smallest guys can move the fastest because they can find their way through that pattern of holes very easily. The largest ones, have a, they're, they're like driving, trying to park an SUV in one of those uh, things where it says compact car only. 
which people do all too frequently in the parking lot. Okay? They don't fit in there very well. They have a harder time navigating. If you ever try to wait for somebody getting out of one of those parking spaces, it's murder. Okay? They have a harder time getting through there. And so the larger guys go slower. So we separate these guys on the basis of size. The smallest, the fastest, the largest, the slowest. And it's in a gel that I can quickly see a distribution of sizes. Everything that's the same size will run at the same place. So what I see in a gel is I see bands. And those bands correspond to molecules, all of which have the same size. I might have a band up here for one of my DNAs that was 1,000 nucleotides in size, and another band down here for one of my, uh, my, one of my DNAs that has 200 base pairs in size. Okay. Now, I have to tell you about agarose gel electrophoresis before I tell you about polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, because polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis is a bit more complicated. Polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, in principle, is the same. I've got a support. I've got uh, the support here is polyacrylamide. That's where it gets its name from. The support is uh, there. And the holes are smaller because proteins are smaller. So why do I have to think about this differently? What do you guys think? Why should I think about separation of proteins differently than I think about separation of DNAs? There are varying charges. Varying charges. With DNA, the charge was proportional to the length. And it was all negative. Proteins, you've already learned, some are going to be positive, some are going to be negative, some are going to be charged zero. If I'm using an electrical current to separate my protein molecules, I got chaos. Imagine I go back to my gel right here. And I put my protein sample right there, and I turn on the negative, I turn on the, the juice. If I don't do anything else, what's going to happen to my positively charged proteins? Are they going to enter the gel? Hell no, they're not going to enter the gel. I just lost all my, all my positives, and I wanted to separate all of my proteins. And not only did I want to separate them, but I wanted to separate them on the basis of size. So when I do protein gel electrophoresis, I have to think of a way of making the protein have the same charge per size that a DNA molecule is. It involves an alteration. And the alteration that it involves is a very cool technique. The technique involves adding a detergent to the protein mixture. The detergent is called sodium dodecyl sulfate, or as you're more likely to call it, SDS. By the way, anytime I use an abbreviation in class, you are welcome to use the same abbreviation. But if you do, you must use the abbreviation exactly. If you call this SSD, for example, we would count that wrong. But you're more than welcome to use SDS as an answer. Here is the structure of sodium I can't say. <laughs> we should go have a beer or something, shouldn't we? OK. Uh, sodium dodecyl sulfate is a, has a long nonpolar end, like a detergent. And at the other end, it has a charge. It turns out that if you take a mixture of proteins and you treat it with a detergent, I didn't tell you the other day how it was that detergents denatured proteins. I said it disrupted tertiary structure, but I didn't say how. Let's think about that for a moment. When I disrupt tertiary structure with a detergent, washing our hands kills bacteria because it's, de it's denaturing proteins, these nonpolar tails are disrupting those hydrophobic interactions that are at the center of that protein. It turns out that this material right here will form a uniform coat over most proteins. There are chemical reasons why beyond hydrophobicity. But suffice it to say that if I take a mixture of proteins and I treat them with SDS, essentially all of them will get uniformly coated with this material. And not only will they get uniformly coated, but they will denature out into long chains. Instead of being folded up, they will straighten out. What I have just done with SDS is make this guy very much like a DNA molecule. Very much like a DNA molecule. Instead of being all folded up, it's straightened out in, in, a, in a linear fashion. Instead of having its own charge of plus or minus or whatever, it's got a polymer. It's got many negative charges. The longer the protein, the more negative charges, just like a DNA molecule. 
Now I can take these proteins that have been treated with SDS and I can apply them to this column that I made before and I can do exactly the same thing that I did with the DNA molecule, DNA molecules, which is put them up here. Here's my negative pole. What's going to happen to those negatively coded proteins? They're going to be repelled and they are going to go into this gel. And the rate with which they pass through the gel will be a function of their size because the smaller ones go through those holes the fastest, just like the DNA molecules did. This technique I've just described to you has a, has a, a, a big name. It's called SDS polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis or SDS PAGE. P-A-G-E stands for polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. So I do SDS PAGE as a way of separating proteins. Okay. Does that make sense? Question. Yeah. Um, what does the SDS do to the, the charge of the protein equation? So what the SDS does, first of all, is it denatures the protein and makes it linear. Mm -hmm. But because it's coating it, we can think of this protein as sort of being in this sort of mix of SDS, is that all that the, the protein, the, there may be you know, a handful of plus or minus charges there, but there are now thousands of negative charges on the outside of that protein. It effectively is converting the protein into a polymer of negative charges, just like the DNA molecule was. So all those negative charges counteract anything that was in that protein to start with, and so we now have a, a polyanionic compound. Many, it has many, many negative charges. Does that make sense? Maybe at this point we should introduce stretch time. Why don't everybody stand up and stretch? You're looking tired. I get to walk around. Stand up, stretch. Think of all those great questions you want to ask me. Nobody wants to do jumping jacks? What's that? You did those earlier. Well, that's good. That gets the oxygen in the brain. I like to jog. I like to jog in the morning, and I find it really gets me going. So, Okay. Well, that's a good place to um, sort of finish up this business of gels and turn our attention to now using gels in an amazing way. I think this technique I'm getting ready to describe to you in a second is pretty cool. Actually, I didn't want to show it. I got the wrong thing there. Um, this technique I'm getting ready to show you um, is um, pretty phenomenal. It is a way of doing gels that um, allows us to study all of the proteins of a cell simultaneously. And not only study them, but study them in a quantitative fashion and a qualitative fashion. It's called, it's called uh, 2D gel electrophoresis. It's down here, wherever my arrow is, there we go. It's down here. Before I tell you about that, I need to tell you one other technique that we use to do it. You've seen SDS page. 2D gel electrophoresis involves two different techniques. One is SDS page, and the other is this technique here called isoelectric focusing. So in order for us to understand SDS, to understand two-dimensional gel electrophoresis, we have to understand isoelectric focusing. Isoelectric focusing is a kind of a cool technique. I kind of wish I was the person that thought this one up. All right? Let's imagine I take a tube, one of those famous columns or tubes that we, that we have, and into this tube I take a mixture of beads, and the beads, the mixture contains the following. Some beads have on one end, have on them maybe let's say molecules that are, have 50 negative charges. And Another group of beads in there have 49 negative charges. And another group of beads in there have 48. And they go all the way down to zero. And then on the other side, I've got beads that have a plus one and a plus two. And they go up to, way to plus 50, for example. And that's just an example. We could have them in the thousands if we wanted to. Okay? So I've got this mixture of all these beads. And these beads are fairly small, so they're mobile. And I take and I shake my column up. Okay? And I take and I place electrodes at each end. I place a positive electrode on one end, I place a negative electrode at the other end. 
What's going to happen to those beads in that column? Well, there's going to be a race. The race is that the most negatively charged ones are going to go towards the positive, and the most positively charged ones are going to go towards the negative. And just like kids at, in a playground, the biggest bullies are going to be the ones that are going to make it to the ends, have the most positive or negative charges, with varying degrees of positive and negative charges, all the way until I get in the middle where there's zero. Everybody with me? Now, this actually sets up a pH gradient. The pH gradient can go from zero, full of protons, all the way up here to 14. No protons. Okay? So I've got a column that essentially has a complete range of pHs in it. Let's imagine I take that same column, and instead of just mixing it up with the beads, I mix it up with my proteins. I've got a mixture of proteins there. Let's say I take all the proteins of my cells, and I squirt them into this column. And I apply that electrode across there. What's going to happen to the proteins in there? Well, the positively charged proteins are going to move one way. The negatively charged proteins are going to move the other way. And they will get to a certain place, and they will stop. The place where they will stop will be their PI. The PI is the pH at which that protein has a net charge of 0, and it doesn't go any further. So I've just separated my proteins on the basis of pH. That's what isoelectric focusing is doing pH being the, their PI. That is the place at which they have a charge of zero. They have migrated according to that. So I could actually take this column and I could say, here's the place where the pH was 6.1. What column, what proteins do I see here? All those proteins in that section of the column would have a PI of 6.1. Now, that's, that in itself is a cool technique. So I've separated them on the basis of their PIs. That technique becomes even more important when we use it in conjunction with SDS, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, and that's what I'm getting ready to show you. But does everybody understand the, um, um, this technique I've, I've just described to you? Questions about this? So you understand that we're separating on the basis of their PI. That's what's, that's what's happening. OK. Let's now uh, take. And imagine that I've just taken that tube. I've got my tube of material, and I've applied those electrodes, and I've got all of these proteins now that are separated in this tube on the basis of their PI. pH 0 over here, pH 14 over here. These are all the proteins of this that came out of this cell. Let's say I'm very careful, and I cut open this tube, and I lay it on top of a polyacrylamide gel full of SDS. And I apply SDS to this tube as well. What's going to happen to the proteins in that tube? Well, they're going to get coated with SDS. They've been separated on the basis of their PA, or the PI. And now I apply a negative, or I apply a current, so the negatives at the top and the positives at the bottom. What's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is that these guys, Here's my tube. I apply the tube to the top. I let SDS get into here. And then I run a current. So now they're separating. What I'm doing is I've got now a single gel that has proteins, one side that have low PIs, the other side that have high PIs, a top that has big proteins, and the bottom that has small. I've separated them on two bases, their PI and their size. You think, OK, well, that's kind of cool. You know, so basically, you've got a bunch of spots. But what significance does that has? Well, have? Well, this turns out to be a very simple representation to give you an idea about how the process works. This process is actually revolutionizing how we study proteins. Okay? This is what an actual 2D gel electrophoresis plot looks like. Each black spot that you see on there corresponds to a cellular protein. This came from a mixture of cells. And though it may be a little hard to see on here, some proteins are very abundant. We see very dark blacks. Others are very, very faint. And we have a hard time telling what they are or how much there are. But we can see there's a range, not surprisingly, 
of amounts of individual proteins. We could say on the left side we've got the uh, proteins that have the um, low PI, high PI on the right, big, small. We can actually analyze, we can actually cut out these individual spots and we can analyze that spot and determine in every case what protein in the cell it is. So what? Wow, you just gave me a whole bunch of things to know. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's there. And a, a given cell might have five or 6,000 proteins, which is about what's on here. So what? Well, here's what's so what. Let's imagine that my Aunt Mamie, I just made up a name here, has liver cancer. OK? And I love my Aunt Mamie. And, I, and I'm a molecular biologist, and I want to know what is the basis of Aunt Mamie's liver cancer. Let's imagine that I take and the surgeon does an operation to remove the tumor from Aunt Mamie and pulls out the tumor cells from her liver. And Aunt Mamie, at the same time, I tell the, the surgeon, can you get a few regular cells while you're at it that aren't cancerous so I can have them to work with? And then the surgeon says, sure. So the surgeon cuts out a little section, non-cancerous and cancerous. I take, I bust open the cells, I do 2 DG electrophoresis on it, and I compare. What's the difference between the pattern of the normal cells and the cancer cells? Well, are there differences? You betcha there are. In one plot, I can look and I can determine, since I can ultimately determine which of the individual proteins are there and the quantities of the proteins, I can answer the question, which proteins are present in the tumor cell and not present in the other cell? Which proteins are present more abundantly in the tumor cell than they are in the normal cell? Which proteins are absent in the tumor cell compared? You can imagine there's an awful lot of things I can learn. I can learn at the level of the protein what the basis of this cancer is. 2D gel electrophoresis is really remarkable in that way. It doesn't have to be cancer. Let's say that I'm a drug designer and I decide, hey, I want to know the effect that my drug has, my new drug has, on the cells of people who are taking it. Okay? How would I do that? Very simple experiment. I take some cells. I could take the cells from people or I could take them in a culture. One group gets the drug, other group doesn't get the drug. I run 2D gel electrophoresis and I ask the question, what's the difference in protein patterns? Oh, wow, look at this. Here's this protein that's being made as a result of my drug. And oops, that one came up in that liver cancer cell thing, too. Maybe I better think about this, right? So 2D gel electrophoresis actually allows us to answer thousands of questions in a single plot and tell us tremendous amounts of things about what's happening in cells at the protein level. This technique that you see on the screen is the basis of a fascinating, relatively new science called proteomics. When you hear the term proteomics, what people are doing is they're studying the, in, the complete pattern of proteins of individual cells. And 2D gel electrophoresis enables that to happen. OK. Questions about that? I'm kind of rambling. I get kind of excited by that, as you can probably tell. Questions about that? Are there what? There are limitations. Good question, OK? So I mean, the way I've described it, it's perfect. Everything is simple and it's fine and dandy. It turns out that there are some variations between the individual gels. And so for this to really work effectively, you have to have everything running exactly uh, the same. That's not something that always happens. And so getting standardized ways of running gels is one of the limitations uh, that people have. So that is a consideration and a concern. No other questions? OK. Um, Let's see, where am I at here? Ah, uh, let's see. That is enough for right now. What do you guys say we do a song and call it a day? OK? Song is a good way to finish the day, I think. I don't have a song today that relates specifically to uh, any of the processes, so I thought I would pull out just a general song. Uh, and the general song that I have for you, it was one I was thinking of yesterday. It's called Biochemistry, Biochemistry is to the tune of O Christmas Tree. <laughs>
Biochemistry, biochemistry, I wish that I were wiser. I feel I'm in way or my head, I need a new advisor. My courses surely shouldn't be such metabolic misery. Biochemistry, biochemistry, I wish that I were wiser. Biochemistry, biochemistry, reactions make me shiver. They're in my heart and in my lungs, they're even in my liver. I promise I would not complain if I could store them in my brain. Biochemistry, biochemistry, I wish that I were wiser. Biochemistry, biochemistry, I'm truly in a panic. The mechanisms murder me, I should have learned organic. For all I have to memorize, I ought to win the Nobel Prize. Biochemistry, biochemistry, I wish that I were wiser. Great. All right, guys. See you tomorrow. Okay. See you tomorrow. Take care. See you tomorrow.